American West. Once it could have been the British, Spanish, or even the Russian West. It became American primarily because of the explorations of two young army officers, Meriwether Lewis and William Clark. Their pioneering journey stands as one of the great achievements in the history of the United States. Private John Collins, Corps of Discovery, United States Army. You're charged with being drunk while posted as a member of the Guard and with permitting the theft of whiskey. Private Hugh Hall, Corps of Discovery, United States Army. You are charged with stealing whiskey this morning, 30th of June, 1804. By a two-thirds majority, a court composed of your peers has found you both guilty as charged. Private John Collins, you're sentenced to receive 100 lashes on the bare back. Private Hugh Hall, you are sentenced to receive 50 lashes on the bare back. Sergeant? Sergeant Floyd? Yes, sir. Step over here. I'd like a private word. The sentences are too severe for the use of the regular lash, Sergeant. You'll incapacitate those two men. I know that, Captain Lewis, but what can I do if it's a sentence of the court-martial? And it's your duty to carry it out, but use light switches. Yes, sir. Guards, prepare the prisoners. Tie them to the oak by the river. West, the continued story of the Lewis and Clark expedition. Now with Harry Bartell as Meriwether Lewis and John Anderson as William Clark, listen to Chapter 2, The Confrontation. After they left St. Charles, Missouri and started up the Missouri River, the first few weeks of the journey were difficult. Besides battling the swift current of the river, the men of the Lewis and Clark Corps of Discovery were constantly bothered by oppressive heat, mosquitoes, sickness, and always the fear of the unknown. Captains Lewis and Clark were deeply concerned. Unless the morale of the expedition improved rapidly, only disaster would result from their inevitable meeting with the Sioux Indians. The whipping of Privates Collins and Hall made our evening campground a tense and unpleasant place. Despite the fact that the court-martial was composed of enlisted men and headed by Sergeant Charles Floyd, resentment over the verdict seemed directed at Billy Clark and me. We were the Martinets, two taskmasters leading the men farther and farther on a dangerous journey into the unknown. I looked at Billy Clark, who was drawing a map of the river we had just traversed, he grinned at me. Poor sort of day, isn't it? Billy, we're never going to make it past the Sioux settlements. Maybe the men will shift their resentment from us to the Indians. The way it is now, they'll break ranks and run. I think it's our fault morale is bad. Our fault? For one thing, punishments have been too severe. The lash has been standard military punishment for centuries. The average soldier accepts it as a part of the system. The average soldier, yes, but these men of ours are hand-picked. Whipping only makes them defiant. What we need to do is touch their pride, their self-respect. What's that? A raft putting into shore. Yes, I see now. Uh, the trappers, by the look of it, four men in a pile of pelts taller than any one of them. It's a fortune in furs. One of the trappers is asking for you. For me? Uh, says his name is Pierre Dorian. Dorian, bring him over here. Yes, sir. This Dorian is a friend of my older brother, George. He was with George during the war at Kaskaskia, Vincennes, and uh, Detroit, I think. Back in St. Louis, Chateau spoke of him. He's supposed to be one of the most experienced men on the river. Captain Clark? Captain Lewis? <laughs> Ah, hello, Captain Clark. Last time I saw you, you were George's little brother. I still am. <laughs> Are you looking healthy, Pierre Dorion? Well, thank you. Uh, meet Captain Lewis. 
Merriweather, Pierre here is the only man who could teach my brother George anything about Indians. <laughs> yeah, and George was the only one who could teach me anything about women. <laughs> you were too young to know, Billy, but George had a way with all females. <laughs> <laughs> Captain Louis, uh, do you know General George? Yes, of course. I was with him at Chachatia. When we are losing a man, he compelled the British to surrender the fort. Uh, I was with him about that. <laughs> Ah, what is that I smell? Venice, huh? You'll eat with us, of course. Of course! It will be like a banquet after eating with the two night after night. I cannot stand roasted dog. What is the story of the Sioux, Pierre? Oh, come, we will talk later over the food, yes? We told Dorian a little about our expedition, and he seemed interested. We talked about what lay ahead of us. By morning, we had decided that Pierre Dorian would be a valuable addition to our party. Ah, oh, a beautiful morning, Captain Louis. Eh? <laughs> a beautiful morning. Eh? But soon I must be leaving. Captain Clark and I have been talking, Dorian. We have no one in our party who can speak the Sioux tongue. Oh, then you will have trouble. Even though they do understand more English than they will ever admit to you. I was wondering if we couldn't avoid that. By taking me up river with you? You'd be doing a service to the American government. <laughs> what is that out here, huh? The Louisiana country is no longer French. It belongs to the United States. On paper, no? Not entirely, Dorian. President Jefferson sent us out here. We represent the United States. Thomas Jefferson? <laughs> oh, there is a good man. I'd like you to interpret for us and then take a representative group of Sioux chiefs back to meet and negotiate with our president. Uh, because I like Monsieur Jefferson, because I love General Jean so much, <laughs> I will help you. I will go back up river and I will take a representative of those thieves to Washington City. <laughs> <laughs> As we moved up the Missouri toward its junction with the Platte River, the men's physical discomfort increased, and morale deteriorated. Everyone complained and grumbled. Then Private Willard fell asleep on guard, a capital offense. He got 25 lashes a day for four days, but the men were still not impressed. We approached the country of the Oto, the first big Indian tribe on our route. And the only marked change among the men was that they began to take better care of their rifles. George Juliard, John Coulter, and George Shannon were on shore. Our hunting party charged with the task of keeping us in fresh meat. Meriwether Lewis was also on shore, making notes on the flora and fauna of the area. I was with the boats. The plat is around that bend, Billy. And we still haven't seen any otos. Now, why? Well, I do not know. That is a tribe I know little about. Huh? Now that's Julia's signal. Oh. <laughs> Suzette, left ready. Land on that sandy area. Yes, All right, I move. Well, I hope he brings more venison for the evening meal. At the time we had landed and started to make camp, Julia and his party came in, heavily laden with fresh meat. A dear ten beaver. Good hunting, George. A man cannot have bad hunting. Game is so plentiful. Oh, we point the rifle, shoot, <laughs> and you eat something as we are. <laughs> we, we. All a man needs to qualify as a good hunter in this country is a strong back to carry in the meat. <laughs> <laughs> see, uh, see any autos? No, no, no autos, but a party of two passed about uh, a mile from us. You're sure they were Sioux? The uh, Teton Sioux, scouting us. Oh, to your eyes, right. All day long I have read the smoke signal in the sky. I wish morale was better. We may have to fight them. Captain Clark, sir. Yes, Floyd. Uh, one of our French boatmen, uh, La Liberté by name, says he knows the autos and he wants permission to look for them and tell them that we're here. <laughs> every Indian, Otto, Yankton, Teton, within a hundred miles knows every step we take. I suppose so. Merriweather, what do you think of this La Liberté? I haven't formed an opinion. What do you think about him, George? He wants to uh, live with the autos for a year. But uh, ask Private Reed, sir. 
He knows that people say better than anyone. But neither man has given me any trouble, sir. Let's take a chance, Billy. Yes. Sergeant, tell La Liberté we'd like him to go. He's to bring back the Oto Chief. Very good, sir. He can leave in the morning and meet us upriver within the week. Yes, sir. <laughs> La Liberté, the free man. Well, there is no such thing as a free man. <laughs> what a ridiculous name. The next morning, we broke camp early and loaded the boats quickly. La Liberté was an hour on the trail, and I was about to lead my shore party onward when Private Moses Reed approached me. Oh, Captain Lewis? What is it, Reed? When I packed my gear, my knife was missing. I'd like to stay and search the camp area for it, sir. I can catch up with the rest later on. The knife can't be replaced out here. Go ahead, Reed. Find it. Thanks, sir. All right, man. Let's move out. That evening, we camped about six miles up from the mouth of the Platte, had a pleasant supper, and settled down to talk. Pierre, we know there are Indians all around us. Uh, could the Otos be staying away because the Sioux ordered them to? Uh, I do not think so. No doubt the Otos are cautious because this party is big and well armed. Captain Lewis, did Reed leave his gear with anyone in your shore party? No. Well, it's not in the boats either. Well, he wouldn't take all that with him if he intended to come back. How about the extra clothing? That's gone, sir. We'll never see him again. That is where you may be wrong, Sergeant. Tell George Drillard to report to me. Yes, sir. George! George Drillard! Billy, it looks like our first desertion. Our second, Merriweather. George Drillard said Reed was a friend of La Liberté. I'll wager they met at the Oto village. Probably. Desertion is a capital offense. We can't afford to let them get away with it. If they do, it'll be a very bad example to the others. And we can't stand much more of that. Sergeant Floyd, say uh, you won't deceive me. Uh, George, Captain Clark and I have reason to believe that Reed and La Liberté have deserted. Yes, sir. He told me so. I want you to find them and bring them back, dead or alive. My guess is La Liberté has a squaw at the Otto camp. I will need two or three men. Take uh, Reuben Fields, Labiche, and Bratton. You better go tell them now. Reuben Fields, Labiche, Bratton. Yes, sir. Floyd, you look pale. Is there anything wrong? Oh, <coughs> nothing but a belly ache, sir. Lately, I've been getting it after meals. Go rest. I'll get you some matter. But I'm on guard duty. Sergeant Ordway can take it for you. Do as I say. <laughs> yes, sir. Floyd seemed better the next morning, but after breakfast, the pain came back. Both Billy Clark and I were reasonably well-versed in doctoring, but neither of us could diagnose this obscure ailment. Floyd bore it manfully, insisting upon doing his share of work. Then George Druyar and his detail returned with one of the two deserters in custody, Moses Reed. The Liberté had escaped. Trooping along in colorful regalia were a number of Oto chiefs. I gave them my welcome speech, stressing that from now on the United States wanted to protect them to live in amity with them. We presented them with gifts of tobacco and beads, and I invited them to observe our justice. Then I convened the court-martial of Private Moses Reed. Private Moses Reed, Corps of Discovery, United States Army, you are charged with desertion. How do you plead? Mm, I was going to come back. I was trying to bring La Liberté back with me, that's all, but he wouldn't leave his woman. I ain't no deserter. Then your plea is not guilty. Yes, sir. Not guilty. Uh, he could be right. Call George Driar. Pick up down right here. Tell the court how and where you found Private Reed. We uh, trail him uh, to the Otto village. He had uh, all his gear with him. Uh, he act like he is planning to stay a while. How do you know that, Drew? Quiet down, Reed. You'll have your chance to tell your side of it. Go on, George. Anyone else in the lodge? Uh, La Liberté, his woman, and uh, the other squaw. What happened when you tried to arrest Private Reed? He fight me and try to get clear. In Private Field and myself, we got him. Uh, the squaws uh, both blocked La Biche and Bratton long enough for La Liberté to get out and to run away. I see. Did Reed say, I'll never go back, or words to that effect? Yes, sir. 
a couple of times. You're a liar, Drew. What? You're a dirty liar. Quiet. The testimony of the other members of the detail, Labiche, Reuben Fields, Bratton, corroborated George Drouillard. Captain Lewis required the court to listen to a disjointed emotional statement from Reed, then gave them the case for their deliberation. It took less than 15 minutes to reach a verdict. Private Moses Reed, this court is unanimous in finding you guilty of desertion. You are sentenced to run the gauntlet four times, the gauntlet to be formed by the enlisted men of this court of discovery. Then you will be dishonorably discharged from the United States Army. Without privileges, you will work as a common laborer with the expedition until such time as you can be safely sent back to civilization. Attention! Attention! Form the gauntlet. Many thought Reed's punishment too severe while others agreed vehemently with the court. Certainly the apathy that attended the other court-martial was missing. Perhaps the men realized at last that each had an obligation to the group as well as to himself. After the punishment was over and after the evening meal, Captain Lewis ordered a dance for the entertainment of the visiting Oto chief. Pierre Cruzat sawed away on his fiddle, and the men started cavorting through the figures of the dance. The Otos grinned and laughed, especially when my man York, with his gift for comedy, went through his paces. Then Sergeant Floyd left the dancers and came over to me, clutching at his side. Captain Clark, the came back worse than ever. While Meriwether continued to sit with the Oto chiefs as their host, I quickly took Floyd down to the boats and made him as comfortable as possible in the keel boat. The next morning, we said goodbye to the Otos, hurrying their departure as much as we could. Then we shoved off. Both Merriweather and I stayed in the keel boat with Sergeant Floyd, who seemed to be in a kind of semi-coma. It's getting worse. I don't understand. Perhaps we should put back to shore. Why? It's cooler for him in the boat. I'd like to know what he has and why he got it. I hope it's not contagious. Face it, Billy, we don't know enough. All we can do is watch his struggle. Either he lives or he dies. Lloyd's fever lasted several more hours. Then, as we approached a high bluff on the east bank, he emerged from his coma, not in recovery, but as if he had willed himself to speak a final time. Captain Clark. Captain Lloyd. I'm going away. Right. Right, my brother. Still. Here. August 20th, 1804, on a bluff overlooking the Missouri, the men dug Sergeant Floyd's grave. He fitted slabs of oak around his body and lowered it into the ground. Floyd's squad stood straight and tall, ready to honor him with a volley from their rifles. Ready? Fire! This man at all times gave us proof of his devotion to duty, his firmness, honesty, and personal integrity. Nothing more can be said of any man. The Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. Sometimes it is difficult to watch a good man go while his inferiors live on. All we can do is trust in the discretion and the superior wisdom of the Lord. Rest in peace, Charles Floyd. We return to the boats. 
About two miles upriver, a tributary flowed strongly into the Missouri. A clean and handsome stream. We named it the Floyd River and made camp across from where its waters blended with those of the Missouri. That night, the men elected Patrick Garris to replace Sergeant Floyd. I presented him with a sergeant's warrant in the Corps of Discovery. The next day, a storm drove us many miles ahead, and the favorable winds continued for several more days until we were well into Sioux country, according to Pierre Dorion. To be more exact, Captain Clark, this is the territory of the Yankton tribe. The Yankton Sioux? Oui. They are less evil and less belligerent than the Teton, whom we will meet later on, uh, provided the Yankton are amiable. The next few weeks, we ran into more signs of Indians. Their spore along the shore, where I was finding samples of an interesting mineral richness, alum, cobalt, copper, pyrites, and of course the smoke signals, ahead of us constantly. We tried to select campsites with an eye to defense. I've been watching Gas. He seems to be taking hold of Floyd's job as if he were born to be a sergeant. I think morale's improving, too. The men are more like a team. Nobody wants to be like Moses Reed. He's a constant example to them of what it means to be shorn of rank and privileges. Captain Luis, Captain Clark. What is it? George, uh, what's the matter? Private uh, Shannon, young uh, Shannon. He is lost. Lost? Yes, we uh, spent hours looking for him. This is no place to be lost in the Sioux country. George, who's the best tracker in the court? Coulter? Oui, Johnny Coulter. Send him out after Shannon. Several days later, with Shannon and Coulter still missing, we had our first encounter with the Yankton Sioux. One of their warriors approached Captain Lewis, spoke to him through Pierre Dorion, and a conference was arranged. It was held near the river where we had easy access to the boats. After gifts were exchanged and speeches were made, Private Pierre Cruzat got out his violin and astounded the Indians with his music. They were amazed by York's smooth black skin and huge muscles, and their jaws fell slack at the sight of the dog, Scannon. <laughs> there is dog enough to feed the whole Yankton nation. The man who kills Scannon would have to kill Meriwether Lewis first. <laughs> Come to think of it, he'd also have to kill me and at least half the men. Oh, this dog is very well protected. Very well. <laughs> I wish Coulter would come back with George Shannon. Oh, it is something to worry about. <laughs> Perhaps the savages have captured them and are secretly holding them to use in bargaining with you, huh? Clark took over the parleying with Dorian beside him to interpret. He inquired after our two missing men. But even when the question was emphasized with the gift of more tobacco and beads... There was no information about them. However, Clark did manage to convince the Yankton Sioux to send an emissary back to Washington with Pierre Dorion. The next day, we said our goodbyes to the helpful Dorion who remained with the Yanktons and continued upriver. On September 6th, John Coulter returned to report that he could not find George Shannon. But a short time later... Merriweather, do you see something up there? Where? Over there. No? Wait. Wait, yes, I do. A man. A white man. Shannon! Where's that? Right, brother! Come to us in the road, boys! Private Shannon was thin and weary, but unharmed. He had subsisted for 12 days on wild berries and one rabbit he'd killed by shooting it with a sharpened stick. He'd run out of musket balls. Originally, he had become separated from the hunting party while stalking a deer and had followed a fresh Indian trail north, thinking it was the trail of the expedition shore party. Only when exhaustion made him rest were we able to catch up with him. On September 23rd, according to my maps, we were 1,100 miles up the Missouri. Our camp was strategically defensible, and we kept sentries on duty around the clock. 
Then five Teton Sioux braves showed themselves and went through an elaborate pantomime of putting their bows and arrows and old trade muskets aside. Meriwether Lewis went out with a twist of tobacco for each one and in sign language asked them to bring their chiefs to a peace conference the following day. Welcome, warriors of the Teton Sioux. Welcome. I come to you from the great chief of the 17 states of America to extend to you the hand of brotherhood and amity. I didn't like the look of it. Two chiefs and their aides faced it. Black Buffalo and an evil, arrogant man called the Partisan. Behind them in a semicircle which kept our back to the river were hundreds of warriors. Their mood was almost as needling and as arrogant as that of the Partisan. They will supply you with all that you may need. We need whiskey. Whiskey! Whiskey! Right in big boat! I don't think they understood a word of what I said. I tell them uh, what you mean, but uh, they make up their minds in advance. They are closed against you. No war! No fight! No kill! The air guns, Captain. That might impress them. Whiskey! Whiskey! Bratton, put a slug into that tree beside the partisan. into tree with magic. No noise gun. Hold thick and long, as big as finger. Ordway, bring a bottle of whiskey. Did you hear that, partisan? For our friends, a drink of whiskey, if that's what they want. We have fine friendship medallions from President Jefferson for you. No, Jefferson. Ride in big boat. Ordway trotted in and handed a quart to me, and I gave it to the partisan, who promptly broke it open and began to guzzle it. <laughs> Whiskey, good. Want boat ride. Want trade, good. Want good gun. We take all good. Oh, we take all boat. Oh, Jefferson, pale face, go back down river on foot. Go. Then the partisan made the mistake of trying to force me to one side as he moved towards the boat. I pushed him back and drew my sword. Prior, man the swivel gun. <laughs> Fire and his men leaped to obey, training the guns on the warriors who stopped their advance, but retaliated by notching arrows in their bows. Then the partisan grabbed for the mooring rope of the keelboat. Not go, both mine, be tobacco, mine. We ran forward and I jerked the rope from his hand. I threatened him with my sword. Everyone in the boat, prepare to fire. Partisan, you see white man's big guns? Me see. Kill many Sioux with one boom. Whiskey. Me want whiskey. Plenty whiskey. And me let you go up river. Get out of here. Tobacco. Tobacco. I took up a twist of the stuff and flung it squarely in his face. We pushed into midstream and headed up river without a fight and without paying tribute. Firmness and a little honest anger in the face of the toughest of the Sioux chiefs had bought us our passage. In his own right, Billy Clark was as tough as the partisan. And we knew well that those smoke signals which preceded us would be supplemented by Indian runners carrying the word that white men of a new and stronger breed were coming. Men who would not be intimidated. been listening to Horizons West, the continued story of the Lewis and Clark expedition. Chapter 2, The Confrontation, starred Harry Bartell as Meriwether Lewis and John Anderson as William Clark. Featured in the cast were Carl Swenson, Jack Edwards, Jack Crucian, Sam Edwards, and Dal McKinnon. Our story was written by Carly and William Tunberg and directed by William Lally. Sound patterns by Gene Twombly. Michael Rye speaking. This is the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service.